All right, we're going to talk about FERPA today, which really has to do with student rights. Anybody know what FERPA stands for? Federal Federal education. education. Federal education. Rights, privacy, privacy. Yes, that's very good. I was trying to make up something else. I was going to say family and educators in other spots, but you know, it, is, it is Family Education Rights Privacy Act. All right, now, so here's the problem, and this was happening before most of y'all were born, of course, but uh, uh, it was introduced by Senator Buckley, and sometimes it's called the Buckley Act. You hear old people like me talk, they, they may not say FERPA, they may say the, Bur the, the, the uh, Buckley Act. But um, it addressed the problem of record disclosure, because you know there's certain things to students that you know are confidential. And before this law, I think it was 1974, that's why I'm saying it before they all were born, uh, there really was no guidance, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But, uh, you know, records were often released to anyone that asked. For example, Megan could go to a school and say, my daughter is dating Billy Bob, and I want to see a copy of his academic records and a copy of his discipline record. Some schools would give it to her because there was no real guidance. And then it might be Billy Bob might go to a school and say, I want the records of social, and they would refuse. So it was really no guidance, and it's kind of everybody was on their own when uh, making decisions about rights. And if a parent wanted to examine their child's records, they didn't have to do it. There was, there was no, you know, there was, uh, I mean, there's no reason not to, but it, by law they weren't required to. So I didn't want you to see child's records, they just say, I'm sorry, they're, they're confidential. Or we don't we don't share that information, and also there was no right to challenge the records. If in the records it said that uh, Kakisha was adopted because no else would claim her, you know, and, and that wasn't true, you know, I'm not so sure they had the right to challenge and get that you know out of the records because there was just no law about it, and, and school officials, you know, back during the old days, you know, whatever they said went, you know, it was before all the student rights and all that that we'll talk about today. Like I said, it was passed in, in 1974, but it contains not only the law, but also some regulations. All right, now, just a couple of key concepts about FERPA. First of all, it says, you know, what is an educational record? And by the way, I understand that they are now working on updating FERPA. They haven't done it yet. Sometimes it takes Congress seven, eight years to get around to something they say they're going to do. But, um, you know, and if you think about 1974, do we even have internet then? I mean, there's a lot of, do we have computers back then, other than Brainiac or something like that? So there's been a lot of changes, but this law has really not been changed. Uh, when is disclosure of an uh, educational record permitted without parental, parental permission? What is directory information? When are parental, parental right, uh, record rights terminated? And what about transferring students and the, their rights to get you know, information or maybe the receiving school? What kind of rights do they have in getting records? So we'll talk all about that with, with FERPA. But um, first of all, do you, anybody know when parents give up their rights to uh, records? A student turns 18. Exactly. Really, when the student turns 18. Now, as a parent, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to have access to my child's records. I don't care if they're 18 or 22. Mm -hmm unless he or she's paying for their own college and staying, oh, you know, right. staying you know, uh, by themselves somewhere and making a living. But as long as I'm putting the bill, I will see some records. I can but tell you that. But school could turn you down if your kid's 18, like in high school? Absolutely. The child goes and signs wow. and says, I do not want my parents to have any access to the records. Legally, you got to listen. All right, so who enforces FERPA? Is it the guidance counselor that walks around with a with a, a ruler to hit people when they're not doing it? Is it the principal who walks around with a coffee mug? Who, who, who enforces FERPA? At the school? Or anywhere? Oh. Actually, it's the United States no. Department of Education, their Family Policy Compliance Office. And like all good educators, you know, they have acronyms, so it's known as FIPCO. <laughs> And it is part of the Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education. And their web address, in case any of you have problems sleeping at night and want to go and read a little bit more about FERPA, then that is the uh, um, web site so that you can access and have some great reading at some point in time. 
All right, so highest appropriate force, really the spending clause, like anything else, the federal government gives about 8% of the money to school districts, sometimes 10 or 12, depending on how poor you are, but it probably averages about 8%. But yet, they control education, basically, even though it's not in the Constitution, it talks about anything not in the Constitution, it's responsible of the state. But I can tell you, federal government really controls education to a great extent, and it just seems for 8% 8 of the money, it's uh, kind of difficult. But that's the way it goes, it's just the tail wagging the dog. All right, so what is an edu educational record since we talked about it? It's two requirements. It's information directly related to the student and maintained by an educational agency or institution. Now, are you part of an educational institution agency? Yes. So if you're maintaining records, then is it considered a student record? Absolutely, because you are the agency. You actually are one of the representatives of the agency. There's only one important uh, exclusion, and that's a sole possession record. For example, if I were not to be in class next week and I had a guest speaker or a substitute come and talk to the class next week, and we're doing, I guess, students with disabilities, um, and I left a note and said, well, you know, Chris is the troublemaker of the class, and you need to make sure that Chris is sitting right up here, right by you, isolated from everybody else. That would be a sole record that I've just made strictly for that substitute. Or I could have maybe something uh, when, when I get ready to line up for lunch to remember that Johnny has to be isolated from peanuts or whatever. And, and if somebody's brought peanuts to eat, you got to keep them away from there. So that's just kind of, it's something really for your memory more than anything else. All right. As I said, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, 1974, and parents now, because of this law, have the right to inspect and review all of their child's records, and then this right transfers to the child at age 18. Now, at 18, it's pretty important the fact that there are some kids that really feel they are adults. Of course, you know, you have some that are homeless as well. I mean, so <laughs> they've been living on their own for, for quite a while. But it also creates some problems sometimes. When I first got to Georgia at the high school, kids that turned 18, they were going to sign them out. They were walking to the third period, found the test, they just walked it off and signed out because they were 18 and didn't need parental permission and they got to be a little bit of a problem. So I just said, we're not gonna do that anymore. I blocked them. I don't mind telling you. But the bottom line is I said, oh, Jonah, so you're 18 now, you're an adult, is that right? You say, yeah, I'm going to sign myself out. Well, that's great. Now that you know, adult, we have a perfect school for you. It's called Adult Education, and we're going to transfer you to that school. And believe me, that kind of stopped people from signing up because, I mean, you know, I can't control them in 18, but I can say I have a right to transfer you to a school that's more suitable. And if you're now an adult and you're making your own decisions, we got a school for you. So that, that kind of stopped the, uh, the signing out. And uh, parents or eligible students have the right to ask for a review of records they believe to be inaccurate or misleading, and schools must respond quickly to this request. You can't put them off uh, you know, a year or something like that. Um, and if they don't like what you have, they can request a formal hearing to dispute the records you have. And in the old days, people used to write a lot of little personal notes about the child uh, in, in, in the student records. Uh, Johnny's a troublemaker or his parents are not very supportive and you know things that we wouldn't do now because we know we'd be liable uh, for a suit. But back in the early 70s and you know 50s and 60s that was done. And if we had incorrect information, if there was a school district that refused to change it, for example said, oh I can't change this, this is run the middle school, this is high school now, I'm not authorized to change anything that the middle school did and go to the middle school and middle school, I can't do anything because the high school, the high school has records now, they're the keepers of it. So that's why they, they have to have some type of uh, way to handle that now. And then schools must have written permission from the parent or eligible student to release any information except school officials with legitimate educational interests, other schools which the student is transferring, specified officials for audits or evaluation purposes, 
compliance with the judicial order, appropriate officials in case of health and safety, and state and local authorities. Now, that's a bunch of mumbo jumbo, but what I'm trying to tell you on that is that if you release information, you need to have some type of written statement. For example, in your high school um, student handbook, there's usually a place in there to say the school will release director information, information about honor rolls, athletics, things of that sort. If you do not want us to release this information, you need to sign a return. Well, you know, parents don't even read that, much less sign a return. And even if they sign it, who knows little Johnny's room to bring it back. But, but the bottom line, if you look in your uh, student handbook, there probably is a place where parents have to sign if, if they do not want you know, that information released. And now, uh, for example, if the State Department was coming in and they were doing an audit of your special education program, would they be able to have access to records? Absolutely, because they have a right, no, they don't have to go and get parent permission because it was part of their duty to do that. Now, if Katisha was an elementary teacher and she wanted to go to the middle school and check on a record, is she allowed to do that? No. No, because she really has no reason to go and check on the middle unless it's her own child. But like I said, if, if her child is falling in love with one of these boys that's in the eighth grade and she wants to kind of check him out, legally she can do it. Even if she was at the same school, she's not supposed to go and look at records of students that don't belong there. And usually there's a place to sign in when you go and look at a record. You're supposed to record that. I'm not saying it's done everywhere, but there is, well, you're supposed to keep a record of who has looked at certain records. Now, most schools don't do that because they have a record room and it is uh, kind of um, out of the way. Yeah, and, but but a lot, some schools do say, you walk in that record room, you sign saying, I came in on uh, you know, September 11th at 3.45 to look at sudden, so, so, you know, even if it's your own class. Um, if a child is uh, transferred or shows up in the doorsteps of another school, you can actually hit the phone and call and say, hey, Buford High School, Johnny is now going to South Gwinnett High School. Can you send me his records? We don't need parent permission to do that. Sometimes we request it, particularly we know if a parent may be con contactless to protect ourselves, but really, if a receiving school needs information from a student, you said, well, they show up on the doorstep, you, you, know, you got to have some type of information. Let me tell you, little Johnny will come and tell you he's in the 12th grade when he's in the 10th. And uh, so, you, you know, you got to have some type of reason. It used to be in the old days that, you know, how you had state textbooks and you had to return them and we wouldn't release the records to another school until so you came and paid back for textbooks or returned them. I'm not so sure that's done anymore. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes you're glad to let them go, you know. <laughs> kind of like teachers when they resign in the middle of the year, sometimes you say, praise the Lord, that's okay. You know, other times you say, no, you're a physics teacher, you got to stay. But, uh, but, you know, of course, if there's some type of health epidemic, measles, or chicken pox, something like that, and people need to get a health department, they have access to records too. If they want to check immunization or whatever they want to do. And, of course, you know, a judge can subpoena records. And uh, so th those are the types of things where people can have access to records even when the parent has not signed for that. And individual students whose corporate rights have been violated seem to have very little remedy to the situation. If people are releasing confidential information, probably the thing to do is complain to the principal or the superintendent or to the school board members and let them you know, deal with it because there's really, in this law, there's nothing that says, well, if they do that and it, you know, you, then you, you fire them or you put them on probation, there's really no set punishment. And so a lot of times nothing's done other than say, well, you don't do that anymore. You're not supposed to do that. All right, what is a personally identifiable information? That would be confidential information, okay? Now, that includes, but is not limited to, Student's name or name of parents or other family members. If I were to say Megan's daughter, if you worked in Beaufort City Schools, you'd probably know who that is. Well, you have sons, I don't you? you I have know, both. Okay, good. I was right then. <laughs> and um, of course, if I, if I say the student's name, then if you know the student, you know who that is. How about Social Security? Does that identify people? That's why a lot of the colleges now have gone to a student ID number rather than a Social Security number. And other indirect identifiers such as a student's date of birth, place of birth, the mother's maiden name, 
probably not quite as bad because you may not would, would know that. Now, although information is not alone or in combination is linked to a specific personality, a reasonable person in the school community who does not have personal knowledge of other circumstances to identify the student. For example, who don't want to pick on? Patrick. Patrick yes. is at a um, social hour Friday night. No, let's make a change. Friday night, you've been to the football game. So, Saturday night, he's at a cocktail party and they're just talking and you know, having a good time. He says, Oh, by the way, the quarter, sorting quarterback at Shiloh High School was caught with drugs yesterday at school and arrested. He didn't mention her name. He just said the starting quarterback at Shiloh High School. I just happened to overhear that. Would that be something that I could kind of figure out who he was talking about and that he's released confidential information? Yes. Absolutely. So he would be in violation of FERPA because he was sipping a little bit too much of the adult beverages and started talking about confidential information you didn't need to do. Yes, Kakisha. Does this cover like student teachers? I mean, do they have the right to go through records as well? Yes, they, they would have because they're authorized to be teaching at your school and learning. So okay. they would they would have access okay. to it as well. Yeah. All right, now I'm gonna give you another example. Still Patrick. He's still at the same cocktail party, having a great time. I mean, look, he, he's through school law and man, he didn't have any worries anymore. But anyhow, so he is talking and he says, oh, by the way, did you hear one of the quarterbacks in Gwinnett County High School got arrested for drugs? Now, is that person identifiable? I think he'd be all right with that. Yeah, he'd be all right, because how many high schools are there? Oh, and he didn't even say starting quarterback. He didn't even say starting quarterback. He said a quarterback. Or if he'd have said a football player, then that's not identifiable. So that's the difference when you're talking about, but if I'm, if, if I'm a, a, in the audience and I can figure out who it is, then you probably have given identifiable information. All right. And information requested by a person with the education agency to reason those identity of the student of whom the record relates. All right, now the record that we talked about is any information recorded in any way. Now you can see how old this law is. It's not only handwriting, print, computer media, video, audio tape, film, microfilm, and microfiche. How many of you have been to micro seen microfiche lately? No. Well, lately, oh, right. not lately, but I've seen it. I've seen it. <laughs> I, yeah, I've, I've dealt with microfiche and microfilm as well, but I, I mean, not anymore, really, right? Okay. That was horrible. And examples of a permanent record? The darkness. Transcripts, dates of attendance, student grades, medical information, financial information, and other personal information. And the reason I would say financial information are we supposed to keep it secret on who's on free and reduced lunch? Yeah. Yeah. Because if we release that information, it lets us know about the financial situation of that parent. So that's why we're real secret when we give out those lunch tickets to the elementary school. Even though the kids already know who, who's on free and, and reduced lunch, we can't say it, okay? Can I ask you a question about that? Sure. Um, our, I mean, a lot of schools do this. We have student aides that are coming around all the time delivering information to students, and pretty often it's documents that contain the student's student number and uh, schedule or all, uh, disciplinary information, all kinds of things. To me, that always feels like it's flirting with a violation of... Well, let me ask you this. If you, if you graded somebody's test, and it was important because it was eligibility time, and it's basketball season, and they need the grade right now to know if he can kind of play this next week in the tournament. And you send it by a student. Uh, it, would that student, if they were curious, be able to open it up and see it? I'd say that that is violating these because open sheets of paper. They're not I, even folded shut. Personally, I think that's viol a uh, violation. And uh, I'll give you another example. We had a, a, a principal that uh, was doing evaluations of teachers, and the copy machine in his office, where he's making copies, broke. And so he got a student to go in down the hall, I guess to the far end or wherever the council's office or whatever, and make copies for him. Well, that student, when he came back and went to one of the teachers and said, oh, I saw your evaluation. And uh, of course the teacher got upset about it and, and you know, filed a complaint. So that again, while it, he 
it wasn't really intentional. He just, he just didn't think about it. Okay, and so that that would be one as well. And of course, he'd be uh, maintained in any format. Okay, what a record is it? Real simple. I can get a click. Uh, that class assignment graded by peers and called out and recorded in the grade book. In other words, if I gave y'all a test and I and I said, okay, I'll trade papers, and I said, okay, Jonah, what did Wayne make? Three. Okay, three out of out of thirty. <laughs> now, that is divulging academic uh, grades, right? But you know what? It's not a violation. What? And, really? And you oh. know why? Because I haven't recorded in the grade book yet. It's only after she tells me what Wayne makes that I put it in the grade book. Then it becomes uh, an official word. So I can't wait to the next class and say, guess what Wayne made, you know, and shut it up, because then I'll be in violation. But legally, you can trade papers, shout out the grade, so that everybody in the class knows about it. Now, that may not make you happy, and you may have some parents to yeah, complain. And I think later on this slide, or maybe in the next group, we're going to talk about a woman, a parent, really didn't like that. And so she filed a... You know, a, you know, a lawsuit and went to court complaining that they were releasing confidential information and the court did rule it's not a grade until you put it in the grade book. Wow. So but now, not, your, not, your, your school not, may have a policy yeah. against it and that makes it if you're breaking a policy. And uh, some emails that uh, indirectly relate to a student. Uh, that's not a record if it's indirect, but if you're writing down that, oh, Johnny's stupid as dirt and must eat glass <laughs> chips and other stuff for breakfast, or so, then you know, you've identified the student, and maybe you're lucky and you have 10 Johnnies in the class, but uh, they probably could still figure out which Johnny you're talking about. So you really need to be careful what you say about So that's why they always encourage you to use initials, and also I can tell you anytime that there's a problem, a good attorney's go subpoena. Emails. Yeah. They're gonna look at it. And let me tell you what, if you're out there going to the no tail motel with one of your favorite co workers, you better make sure you're not using school computers to, to uh, set it up because they will quickly subpoena that. But anyhow, yeah, that's something different from student records. Information which a student's identification is not easily discernible. Like I said, a quarterback in Gwinnett, one of the Gwinnett High School, or at, in Gwinnett County. And like I said, the sole use notes that we talked about uh, earlier. And of course, what may uh, be a record, easy way, everything else. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what, you know, I really do think they need to overhaul this, but uh, FERPA does not categorically define records, but it looks at what the records contain. And if the record contains personal identifiable information and it's maintained, then it's an educational record or as I like to say, it may be an educational record. That's why you have attorneys. They're the ones that make that decision and the judges. Now, what is director information? If permitted to designate certain information is director information. And that would be, you know, uh, uh, like I said, a letter must be sent out annually to parents and eligible students and allow the opportunity for them to refuse to allow the information to be released. And it's names, addresses, telephone numbers, degrees and honors received, major fields of study, participation in officially recognized activities, sports, dates for tennis, honor rolls, athletic statistics, scholarship awards. That's why when you have awards day at the high school, they can announce that Johnny got a $20,000 scholarship to Georgia Tech. And, uh, you know, because the parent has not signed that they uh, don't want that. That's also a lot of times when you post pictures on your teacher webpage, you can post those pictures because, you know, you really have, uh, uh, you, they didn't object to you posting that on your, on your class side or, you know, the athletic statistics, honor rolls, that type of thing. Now, I'm just curious about this. So we're at, we're at the elementary school, and I'll pick at the elementary school people, and uh, we'll pick on Wayne and say, uh, since this seems to be your, your, your day, Wayne. Yes. Um, <laughs> a parent comes to Wayne and says, little Johnny, broke my daughter's glasses on the playground. I want his parents' name, his address, and phone number. Can you give it to him? No. 
was hoping. Director of Information, if the parent didn't sign, I would still hope the principal would not. Here's what I would do. You're right. I, that's yeah, a, I, I agree with that. Right. If I were the teacher, I'd say, sir, that's above my grade level. You right. need to go talk to the principal. Yeah. <laughs> now, most people wouldn't give, you know, give it out, but I'm going to tell you, if I'm an attorney, I'd say, that's director information. They have a right to know that. I want to know Johnny's parents' address. They didn't sign it. Show me where they signed, but you can't release that information. But I would tell you, as a classroom teacher, I would not release that. I said, no, sir, you need to find something out. And if I were the principal, I'd say, I got a better idea. Let me call them and have them call you if they want to. I had that happen. Yeah, the parent been. wanted a meeting with the other parents. Yeah. So and you had the reference. I asked that. <laughs> that That's what I would do, too. I said, if you want to meet, let me tell you what. Mm -hmm. I will contact and have call you, sir. Right. Exactly. Good, good, good move, buddy. All right, so, and who exercises rights? Either parent, unless parents' rights are severed. It includes natural parents, guardians, an individual acting as a parent, and individuals who are present on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm going to kind of define that for you. That's a lot of gobbledygook. When I say either parent, if Megan and Mike are divorced, they live separately. And they both they have a child. It they have a right to those records. The only way that Mike or Megan wouldn't have access to those records would be as during the divorce, they got a judge to say Mike does not have parental rights, has no access to the records. That is the only way because as a parent. Now, if I'm a neighbor, and Mike has gone on a trip to Europe for two weeks, and I'm taking care of his child, because he couldn't only afford but to him to go. Gosh. Then I have access to records, sign him out and all that, simply because I've got the day-to-day -day care. Okay, or it may be your guardian, or maybe you've taken somebody in for a while, then that would change, and that, that would be one where you also have uh, access. So it really makes it very confusing. And many times you'll have a parent to come and say, I want to sign up my child. And they've driven from Raleigh, North Carolina mm -hmm. to here, and their name is not on the sign out list. And they raise sand at the office because they can't check their own child out. All you do is say, Sir, it's not on the signing sheet. When you got registered, your name's on there. You go to court, you get an appropriate document, and we'll be delighted. To, to let you sign your child out. That happened to my brother. I mean, his wife was divorced and she moved to Connecticut. And he went to go sign out his daughter because that was his time to have her. And they said no. And so he pulled out all his court papers saying that he had legal right to sign out. And so it was a big thing. They had he had to, but they finally let him do it because mm -hmm. he had the court documents, mm -hmm. right? And that's the, you don't want to get into the middle of a family dispute. You just say, sir, I'm not trying to argue. You show me the appropriate documents, we'll be glad to release them. But until you show me that, I cannot, legally I cannot release. I had an Uber driver show up trying to sign out a child. Oh I had to send him back, get mom, bring her back to the school. <laughs> but. Well, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, somebody will call and say, oh, I've got, I've got an emergency and I want to uh, have Billy Bob sign out Susie Q. A lot of people won't do that anymore because you don't know who actually mm -hmm. called. Now, if I know the parent, I can say, okay, give me your child's social security number. Give me, if they can give me some information about the child, I mean, a lot that only so I may would release over the phone. But most of the time, you can't afford to do that now because somebody's going to walk in and kidnap mm -hmm. a child. And of course, students over 18, that when they reach age 18, they're considered an adult. You have to give an annual notification of rights. It's usually posted on the website. Now you have to, used to have to send home a stack of papers, you know, back in the old days, but now you can post it on the website and just make, you know, comments about, you know, things on the web. And uh, they have the right to uh, inspect and review records, as we talked about, seek changes in the records, and consent to disclosure on who you release information to. And, you know, procedures. That, that you have to follow. All right. Now, 
if, when you get a request, you have to respond within a reasonable time, not more than 45 days. If I've got a parent that wants to see a record, I will probably let them do it that day, assuming it's a convenient time. Now, if it's in the middle of, of uh, practicing for graduation, or we've got the last day of school and everybody's busy, I'm have to say, you know, come back tomorrow. But for the most part, they want to see a record, I'm going to let them do it that day. Now, let me ask you this question. Do we let Chris take this record of his child and go and inspect it? Maybe go to another room so we can really have time to really review the record. No. Absolutely not. I would not let Chris leave because you don't know how many records he's going to take and what he's going to leave. I'll be glad to sit with him and we can go page by page and he can look at it. If we want a copy of something, we have a right to charge. But I'm not going to charge a parent for a copy of a page. Now, if you got one of these people that's been in special ed for 12 years and has 17 lawsuits against you in there, you know, the ducks like that, then I'm going to probably charge per page on that. But Because uh, legally you can charge a reasonable cost, 25, 50, even a dollar a page. You can charge the person for the, you know, their hourly rate uh, to do that. But bottom line, if I just got to make four or five pages, I'm just going to, you know, do it and let the school pay for that. All right. And uh, you cannot review the records of others. All right. Let's give you an example. Keisha comes into that school and she is mad as to dickens. Her sweet daughter got suspended off the bus and she wants to see the tape because her daughter says that everybody else started to fight and she didn't. She was just defending herself. Does she have a right to see that tape? Probably not because when she's viewing that tape, she's viewing everybody else too, right? And she has no right to that. Now, what I could tell her, well, ma'am, you know, I'm not, I'm technologically illiterate, but I know this great store over here that I can send the video to and they can white out every face except your daughters. It probably will cost me $250, $300. Now, if you want to pay that, I'll be glad to go and get that uh, video altered. And then that probably will make it where she didn't want to. But I mean, seriously, that's, if you insist on seeing the tape, that's what I could say to you, is I cannot show you that tape with other identifiable students. But if you want me to go and get it done, you give me the money up front, then I'll do it. And it's the same way with records. If they want something done, open records request, and they want something, if it's going to exceed like $25, you have every right to say, you give me the money first, then we'll proceed with doing that. And it's the same thing when you know, the, the parents' man say, well, my Susie got suspended for two days. How many days did Johnny get? He started to fight. Oh, yeah. You can't say. You just have to say, man. That is our confidence information. I can't let me just assure you that he was punished appropriately. You don't have to say he didn't get any dates. I mean, you know, you just say he was punished appropriately. Now, if a parent, a student cannot inspect and review, you must make a copy. For example, <laughs> Mike <laughs> is in jail, but he loves his daughter and wants to make sure she's still making straight A's. And he requests copies of her report card and her test scores. Does he have a right to it? Absolutely, unless there's a court document uh, that, that is separating his rights, that is correct. You have access to them, and since you can't come for conference and, and review them, they have to send them to you. And you cannot destroy records that are requested, and you can charge a reasonable fee. Now, I said you cannot destroy records that are requested, but I have known people, and I won't point fingers at Atlanta Public Schools with the testing, but there were some documents that were destroyed there. I can't prove it, but uh, that's what I've been told. So what I'm trying to say is you cannot legally destroy a document. Let me say it that way, okay? <laughs> All right, disclosure without parent permission. We talked about that. You know, most of the time we get a signed consent form anyhow. We try to at least inform them of that. But you know, we're talking about all the school officials with the, with the need to know, uh, needs related to the student's educational records or the schools where he seeks to enroll, and that includes college. And then Georgia Law 20-2-310, uh, direct information that you can get to military recruiters, that is legal. Uh, you know, we do a lot for the military. And inspection of records by parents, information concerning the child's educational records shall not be withheld from the non-custodial parent unless there's a court order. 
But remember, federal law FERPA supersedes, you know, Georgia law. And uh, we talked about the peer grading. I thought it was on this slide too, but in, in a, a Swaso Independent School District, they did rule in 2002 that peer grading is legal, and they said that student papers being graded by another student are not at the stage maintained by the teacher. Only when you enter in the grade book. All right, we're going to talk about student rights. You know, we've already talked a little about FERPA. We've talked about some of the court cases. So now let's kind of talk about student rights. And let me tell you, when this first started, it was kind of unusual because students didn't have rights. Right. You know, it was the teachers and administrators that ruled supreme. And it was, wasn't any thought the students have a right. They were under the age of 18 and they were subject to all school rules and rationale. But that's really not unusual, because you think about it, at one time, did we allow women to vote? Mm -hmm. At one time, how about African Americans? Did they have all the, all the, the, the rights that, that others had? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, so things change, and really the court system is what really changes some of the things that, you know, th that we deal with. So, yeah, so let's talk about student rights. What rights do students have in regard to expression, appearance, privacy, confidentiality? We're going to talk about some of that today. When are searches and drug testing warranted? We've already talked a little bit about searches. Can students be disciplined for off-campus behavior, school-sponsored and non-school-sponsored? Freedom of speech. Five important cases that dealt with freedom of speech. We have Tinker, we have Goss, we have Kular, we have Fraser, and we have Frederick. Those are the five that are going to deal with freedom of speech. Okay? So let's look at it. Tinker versus Des Moines, Iowa Independent School District, 1969, before any of you were born, right? Now, what was going on? Anybody as a history person that would know what's going on during this time? Desegregation? Woodstock? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think you're right about that too, but there was some of the Vietnam War as well. But I think you're right on those as well because you could see the growing unrest, but I think maybe Woodstock was a little bit later, but anyhow. So, in December of 1965, because no matter how long it takes to get up to court and make a decision, particularly these are Supreme Court decisions. And I'm not talking about Georgia, I'm talking about U.S., the big daddy of them all. But in December 1965, a group of adults and students met to make plans to publicize their objections to the Vietnam War because it was a very unpopular war. A plan was devised in which students wore black armbands to signal their protest. Can you imagine students wearing a black armband to school? <laughs> well, like any good administrative team, they kind of heard about this and became aware of it over the Christmas holidays. So they quickly met and they came up with a policy and said any student wearing an armband would be asked to remove it. But if they didn't, they would be suspended. So they were a step ahead of Tinker in the fact that they heard about it and so they set a policy to prohibit it. Well, Christopher Eckhart, who had to be a neighbor, John Tinker, and Mary Beth Tinker wore armbands to school, black armbands. They refused to remove the armbands and they were sent home. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court and you have to think, I mean, it would never happen now, but I mean, mm -hmm. back during this time, like I said, what rights do students have? And what the court basically said was students do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech at the schoolhouse gates. In other words, just because you go to school and walk on school property doesn't mean you lose your rights. You have constitutional rights just like every other person. And that was really a kind of a new interpretation because before that time it was considered they didn't have rights. And in fact, one of the judges, one of the sinning judges, I'm a paraphrase and use Paul Shaw's language probably than he is, 
But when this decision made where they recognized the students had rights on the school campus, he said, well, the schools are going to hell in the handbasket. You know, basically what he was saying was, this is going to create a lot of problems for the schools because who's going to be an authority now? If students think they have rights, they go, you know, question everything that, 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 that it's done. And uh, that idea should not be suppressed just because it makes school officials seem uncomfortable. There was really no disruption in that school just because they wore the armbands, and even now there are things that can be done. And in fact, you'll see in some of the court cases where people think there may be uh, a, a problem, but yet it's not proven. And so you, have, you almost have to prove there's going to be a problem in order to call it a disruption. And there was no record that the expression would lead to substantial disruption. Now the reason the parents chose to, to take this to court was back then in the 60s, if you, you know, your discipline record was shared with, with, with colleges and you might have get in if you were suspended and things like that. So it was serious back then when you got a suspension. And, uh, and so they did recognize they had rights. Now, Goss versus Lopez, moving up now, the real war, 1975. Uh, suspensions were out of a period of, of widespread unrest in the Columbus public school system. Now, I think you're getting more into the demonstrations and the... Uh, I checked Woodstock was 69. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, well, you checked. Good for you, then. Okay. You must have attended. No, you were too young. All right, so anyhow, there were demonstrations in the auditorium and disturbance in the cafeteria, which resulted in school property being damaged. Not only that, the administrators started suspending these kids, saying, you're suspended, Wayne. You're suspended because you're, you're suspended, Chris. And sent them home. I mean, you know, it's because it was, I mean, it was massive disruption. In fact, there were even kids coming from all the schools to participate in the demonstrations. And of course, Lopez, like any other good student, claimed he was an innocent bystander, just having to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that he should never have been suspended. Well, lo and behold, students were given 10 days suspension without a hearing for this gross disruption of school. That's a long time. And the courts ruled, Supreme Court, that the plaintiffs were denied due process and the suspensions were ordered to be removed from the school records and they establish what you need to do in order to suspend a student. What they said is if it's 10 days or less, it's a short-term suspension. At that point in time, all I have to do is say, Patrick, I'm suspending you for smoking in the bathroom for four days. Patrick says, I wasn't smoking, I didn't do anything. I'm innocent. Okay, I hear you, but I don't believe you. You're suspended for four days. Did I meet the letter of the law? Yes, because I told him about what the charges were. He had an opportunity to give his side of the story. And as a minister, I chose not to believe him. So it is legal to have that suspension. Of course, if he's under the age of 18, you want to notify the parents as well. But bottom line is it's legal because I did what the courts now require, which is to give notice of the charge, explain what it is, and give him an opportunity to tell his side of the story before you make that final decision. Now, if it's more than 10 days when they can claim it's a long-term suspension, he can certainly go, he is entitled to a hearing. You talked about this tribunal hearing and uh, in your presentation. And a tribunal is when there's a panel. It can be made up of parents, it can be made up of administrators, it can be made up of, of uh, um, teachers. It's just whomever the school district has chosen to train and serve on a panel. And then that principal presents to the panel the charges, provides what happens, and then the student can bring an attorney and present his side of the story and then the tribunal makes the decision. Now, whether it be a student tribunal or later on we're talking about a teacher tribunal when you dismiss a teacher because some large school districts use tribunals rather than the board hearing. That can be appealed to the board and the board can overrule 
the tribunal or they can agree with the tribunal. And what they do, they just listen to the tape recording or the you know, minutes or whatever was taken. And they don't have to have a second hearing. They just look at the evidence. Kind of like what they do in courts when you appeal. Sometimes they just look, read the transcripts and make a ruling. All right. And there are minimum requirements of notice and a hearing prior to suspension. Of course, except in an emergency situation. All right. So that's, that's that one where uh, with Goss versus Lopez, they established what rights a student has before being suspended. Short term, not a lot. Long term, if it's more than 10 days, yes, you need to have a hearing and give them opportunity to have an have attorney with them. Bethel School District versus Fraser, 1986. Fraser delivered a speech nominating a fellow student for an elective office and approximately 600 students were in attendance at the assembly. Now this is a little bit different from what most schools do. Most times, if somebody elects to run for an office, they just sign up and then they give a speech. Well, in this school, somebody would nominate a person and then give a supporting speech. And he had met with teachers the day before and kind of reviewed the speech. And the two teachers said, ooh, I'm not so sure that's a good idea. Uh, I don't think I would use that. I think you probably need to rewrite your speech. Well, like any good hard-working student, he ignored the teachers, and he presented his nomination the next day, and basically what he said is, I know a man who is firm in his pants. Jeff is a man who will go to the very end, even the climax. He doesn't attack things in spurts. He drives hard. Oh my God. Now, what do you think happened when he made that speech? Everybody fell out laughing. Well, what do you think the school did? Oh, You're right. They suspended. There you go. They suspended. Oh. Well, what do you think good old mom and dad did? I lost Absolutely. You cannot, you cannot suspend my child. He has constitutional rights. He has freedom of speech. So, it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, not so fast, my friend. If you will be rude and vulgar and profane, it cannot happen in a school setting. And so they did rule on behalf of the school district on this case. All right, the next one. Hazelwood School District versus Coolmine. Remember, we're moving up. We're in 1988 now. We're really getting to modern times almost. Rebecca will be born soon. Well, all right. Rebecca will be born soon. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> all right. Case concerns to what extent educators may exercise editorial control of the school newspaper as part of the school journalism's class. In other words, it was a school journalism class. Their, their job was to produce the newspaper. But it was part of the curriculum. It wasn't an extracurricular activity. It was an actual class that was taught by, I'm assuming, one of the English teachers. I wouldn't think a social studies teacher would do it. I would think it had to be English. But I could be wrong. Okay. Now, the newspaper was published every three weeks, and more than 4,500 copies were distributed to students, school personnel, <coughs> and members of the community. It was a popular thing. Wow. Now, for the end of the year edition, two articles were submitted featuring articles on students attending the high school. One who blamed her father for causing divorce in her family, and another article who discussed the student's pregnancy. So two different articles, one about blaming her father for a divorce, another one about the student being pregnant in school, but the names of the girls were changed to protect identity. Now folks, what did we say, um, uh, well we didn't say how big the school was, but uh, let me ask you this, back during that time in 88, do you think if a girl was pregnant, don't you think maybe, even if you used a fictitious name, do you think somebody could figure out who it was yeah, during the article? And uh, so the principal in this case said, oh no. We're not going to allow these two articles because number one, you know, even though you have mentioned, changed the names, people know who they are. And secondly, you know, this girl's writing an article and the father's had no input. We hadn't heard his side. 
we know the girl blames the father, but what does the father think about this? Maybe it was the wife's problem that the daughter is unaware of and why they got divorced. And so he said, nope, you can't do it, and you don't have enough time to rewrite the story because publication is tomorrow. Well, of course, when it was denied, after that, some of the kids on the newspaper staff took it to court because freedom of speech. They were not allowed to voice their concern about divorce or pregnancy. Well, bottom line, the Supreme Court again ruled on behalf of the school system. And the reason they said that was number one, it's a course that the school district was paying for. So if the school district is paying for that course, then they ought to have some type of jurisdiction over it, the contents. And furthermore, you could already say, see, the school district had some decisions because they decided it was going to be published every three weeks. They decided how many copies were going to be made. So there was already in place things that were regulated. And so they did rule in, in favor of the school district on that one. All right. Now, Morse versus Frederick, 2007, all of you were born by then, so you should know a little bit about this one. All right? Now, this occurred during a school-sanctioned and school-sponsored event in Juneau, Alaska. Now, folks, I hope I'm not hurting anybody's feelings here, but there's not a lot of excitement that goes on in Juneau, Alaska that I'm aware of that would make me just want to pack up and move there, okay? But they actually had something important that was happening in Juneau, Alaska. The students were allowed to walk away from the school in order they would go move off the school grounds and they would go to a nearby road and they would go watch the Olympic torch being passed through the town. You know where runners come through, pass that torch. I mean, that's probably the only time I've been done in Juneau, Alaska. So it was a historical event and the school had agreed we just let the kids get off campus and, and view that. Well, good old Frederick did not attend school that day. He just maybe just didn't feel like going. Maybe he uh, maybe he had a bad cough that morning. But anyhow, as they gathered for that historic event, he joined them because they were his classmates, and it was off campus. He said, "Why can't I do that?" And then during this time, he unveiled a banner that said, "Bong hits." For Jesus. Oh. Now, for all of you bright secondary people, what do you think this is referring to? I know elementary wouldn't know, but you have any idea? They're referring to what? Marijuana. Marijuana. There you go. Exactly. He was, in other words, he was talking about let's let's uh, have a little bit of fun. Well, the principal next walked up to him and said. You gotta take that banner down. Unlike any good student that cut school that day. He said no. <laughs> she had to make a very quick decision then on what to do about this child. It was off campus. She had asked him to remove it. He had said no. So she suspended him. Of course, that violated his freedom of speech, and he was off campus and didn't feel like that he had to listen. Well, the courts ruled in favor of School. The school. That's exactly right. Because the one thing that they really said was, you know, in the school in the curriculum, we advocate that drugs are bad for you. You know, smoking is bad, the drugs are bad. And she had every right to go up there and ask that because he had violated the school policy. And that um, if she didn't, she would have sent a message to all students that it's okay to take drugs. But yet there's a law in Alaska and in Georgia that we're supposed to teach the dangers of alcohol and drugs. And so the court did rule for it. All right, now, even though students do have certain rights, hate speech is not protected. Also, if you've got people that are uh, threatening people, you know, uh, and, and you know, maybe have that in writing or saying something about, well, boy, tomorrow I'm gonna go and shoot some people, that certainly, again, would, would be something that, that is not protected by freedom of speech. When we talk about dress, that's a little bit grayer. Now, um, and we'll get into a couple of cases. If, if you're 
wearing a KKK outfit, I would say that that probably is one that the um, school district could address because that is certainly hate and, and is that way. But if, um, and, and if you're wearing a Confederate regalia, maybe like a Confederate flag, in some places it would be very um, inflammatory. Other places, I mean, I, guess, I don't know, I've never lived in Minnesota, but I would think if you wear, uh, you know, something in Minnesota or South Dakota, probably it would have the same reaction as if you wear a Confederate flag uh, situation here. Uh, also, you know, uh, alcoholic beverages, symbols, critical messages regarding political figures. That's not to say you can't wear something with, you know, Obama picture or things of that sort, but you know, it's a little bit grayer in that area. And uh, it certainly, I know most schools do ban somebody wearing something with marijuana on it or any type of Budweiser, but yet you go to the baseball or football field and see all these billboards here, Joe's Bar and Grill and uh, Hooters and all them are paying to be advertised and kind of, to me, it sends a mixed message there if you've got that. But anyhow, and then of course threats, courts up, up take, up, uphold taking action there. And off-campus speech and communication students enjoy a little more protection because kind of what they do in their off time to a certain extent is protected. Yes, Mike. Uh, you just made me think of something. We had a discipline talk with our sixth grade, uh, and the AP was saying that the cyberbullying now that they can take action even if it happens off-campus at home. They can take action against that student who threats another student, even if the threat goes, you know, it's completely off campus. They can now do something about that. Where last year they couldn't. I think the courts, as we talked about the school safety, they are swinging really more and more towards schools taking action off campus for cyberbullying because there's been suicides and creating a lot of problems. But there are still some courts that will say, you know, we didn't see where it was going to be a, a disruption. You block things, you know, from your school that they can't access and so but but I would say yeah I would roll the dice on something like that if I had to go to court because I think most courts now will uh, side with the school when, it, when when kids feel threatened and bullied. Now what I was going to say on this off-campus speech communications and uh, excuse my language but let's say uh, who don't want to pick on um, We'll pick up Jonah for a few minutes. Let's say Jonah was going home from school, you know, as a tired, and she's tired that day, and she gets about four blocks off campus driving, and she sees two of her students, uh, you know, walking, I guess they're walking home, and they give her the one finger salute, you know, and I give it right back. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so, anyhow, she is upset with that disrespect because she is a wonderful teacher. I mean, she's been teaching a year three times at her school. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so she goes in tomorrow morning and tells the principal, I want you to suspend Johnny and Billy because they embarrass me and they, they defame me and just really upset me with disrespect. Well, let's say the principal tried to suspend them and the parents objected. Who do you think is going to win that case? Parents. The parents probably because it's off campus and really she's kind of a public figure and she's got to expect a little bit of criticism every once in a while. Now, if they had done it in her classroom on campus, it's, it's a huge difference there. But as we talked, even with that Barstow case, you know, sometimes when there's action done off campus, you can deal with it. But you better be able to show that it's going to be disruption, it's going to be fear, things like that sort of thing. I suggested that you get a couple of parents to write letters, teachers to write letters on that. Of course, private schools enjoy more flexibility than public schools because private schools, you're choosing to go there, and when you agree to go there, you're kind of giving up some of your rights to follow their guidelines, whether it be that you've got to go uh, read the Bible every day, or whether it's that you've got to go to Mass uh, you know, in the afternoons, or whatever that private school suggests that they are strong about that you have to do it, where in the public schools, where you're kind of mandated to go to school, you certainly have more rights because you didn't make that choice to go to the school. You were by law required to go to school. All right, social media is relatively a new phenomenon. And I know that, that you're saying, no, it's not really. But look at it this way. Court cases take four to five years to make a decision on something of that sort. By that time, we have already gone to something else. And a perfect example of that is when Facebook first came out, Kids used it. 
now who uses Facebook? It's all the adults and kids got off of Facebook and they're using Snapchat and Instagram and, and you know, everything else, Tumblr and, and all kinds of things that I can't even spell, much less know how to do. And so the courts really have a hard time catching up with all, all, the, all the things because technology is changing quite rapidly. You know, bullying is on social media, and we just talked about cyberbullying, sexting, and let me tell you what, middle school kids probably do that worse than high school kids. YouTube, tell you what, you go and have a teacher tantrum at, at, at class, I guarantee you somebody in your school is going to have that uh, on their phone, particularly middle school and high school. Elementary, some of the kids may not have phones, but I think some of these kids are getting phones at age 8, 9, 10 now, so you just never know. All right, so let's talk about student discipline and appearance. Student dress. Phillips versus Anderson County School District, 1997. Anderson County is in South Carolina, just across the border, uh, fairly near Clemson. Okay, and uh, a student was not allowed to wear a Confederate flag jacket. Well, he said, you're not allowing me to um, show my pride for my family and, and our, um, what? Uh, heritage. Heritage, thank you, that was the right, right word. And uh, so he took it to court, and uh, this court ruled in favor of the school system because they could cite where they had other times people more that and it caused problems. And so they could prove that there was a potential disruption there, and not just potential, there had been disruption in the past. Dillon uh, 3, I believe, which is Latta, South Carolina, also had a child wear a Confederate flag, and the courts ruled for the school district on that as well. So pretty much if you can prove that there's going to be some type of drama, you had disruption in the past, then you're probably okay with that. Isaac versus Board of Education of Power County, a provision of no hats was upheld. They just, they did not allow hats, and so it was okay. Now, here's what I would tell you, this is Paul Shaw, I'm not an attorney, but if you have a provision of no hats, and then you have a hat day, and you charge everybody a dollar, and it goes to the Red Cross or the PTA, or whatever, give them a right to wear a hat that day, then I would probably tell you they could wear a hat every day. That's what I would, I would, I would assume, because you've already violated your policy. Of course, when that, and I've even had one teacher tell me it makes them mad because what they're doing is coercing kids to give money for their favorite charity, for the teacher or the principal's favorite charity, just to wear a hat. So, you know, say that. All right. Now, student was not allowed to wear a head wrap in celebration of her African American and Jamaican heritage, but exceptions were made for headgear uh, for Muslims because that was pretty much religious in nature and not heritage, but religious. And remember, you do have some religious freedom that we've talked about. Due process, and we talked about that just a little bit when we talked about Goss versus Lopez. And uh, you know, there are a minimum number of, se of, of steps you have to take in reaching the decision. And that is the notice and a right to a fair hearing. That fair hearing may be just me listening to you. If it's, if it's uh, a, a more than a 10 day suspension, then it is just like a court, a court hearing. And uh, sometimes, you know, when, when people appeal a decision of the school district, whether it be a suspension or expulsion, or whatever, and they appeal to a federal court and say they've been discriminated against, then they start looking very closely at a whole bunch of things, not just that one exact case, but like I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Office of Civil Rights, and at one time, if they got a complaint, they would come in and assume you were guilty and just ask for all kinds of, I shouldn't say assumed you were guilty, but I'll put this way, they would require you to produce a whole bunch of documents for them to review before they made a decision. And I remember one time it just made me madder than fire because I was in South Carolina and there were five school districts in the county. A parent, an African American, got mad uh, at a school district uh, and so he filed a discriminatory suit against four of the five school districts in that county. The one that he didn't file the suit against was a, a, a large minority population. In other words, they had about 85, but all the rest of us probably had a fit. And we actually had to go back five years and provide all kind of discipline records. Now, this was back in the, uh, um, I gotta think about when I was there, let's see. It was, uh, 
late 80s, late 80s. And uh, we had to go back five years and, and show all of our discipline records uh, about, by race, by sex, by, you know, all that. And we also had to, had to do all of our um, <coughs> hiring. We had to show about that, all the applications and who we are. And it really made me mad because, number one, he wasn't even in our district. And yet he was filing his complaint against us and we had to do it. So, you know, I, have, I guess I'm just a little... Sorry about that. But this is, is one where, seriously, when, when some people follow, sometimes when federal government looks in, they go look and say, okay, you got 30% African-American population in your school. How many African-Americans are suspended? And maybe 70%. And then you say, well, if you got 70% Caucasian, how many have been suspended? Maybe 20%. That begins to look a little bit like disparity. And, but then you have to look at it a little more closely. If, let's say, fighting takes place. All right, now, if they can show that African Americans have been suspended for an average of six or seven days for fighting, and Caucasians have been suspended two or three days for the fighting, then again, that kind of looks like discrimination. Or if you suspend girls for two days and guys for five days. Again, you know, so, so you have to make sure that when you are disciplining kids and when you're, you know, that you need to at least be aware of how it looks. You need to look at that data. In fact, that's why the State Department requests that data every year now on suspensions and they have to determine what schools are safe and which ones are not, but also the federal government requires it. All right, like I said, suspension from, uh, from school from one to 10 days, the procedural guidelines, the student must be given an oral written notice of the charges. Like I told Patrick, uh, the, it was, it was, uh, um, he was smoking. And uh, yeah, if, if he denies the, uh, the charges, uh, the explanation of the evidence the authorities have and an opportunity for the student to present a side of the version. You know, he said he wasn't smoking. And I'll say, why? He said, why well, don't smoke? And I said, well, Miss Jones, the teacher saw you smoking, and I believe her. That's it. He had an opportunity to deny it. I gave him you know, why I was going to still make that decision. And that these steps must be taken immediately following misconduct or infraction. Now, by immediate, let's say that he was smoking on school at 3 o'clock. And the teacher came to report when I went out to find him, he was gone. Well, certainly I could call him in the next day. Or if I'm out sick the next day, or I've got a, one of those big week principals meetings that day, I could, you know, wait a day or two. But, you know, it's, you can't, I can't wait a month and then say, oh, by the way, Patrick, you know, on September the 11th, it's not October the 15th, you were smoking. No. You have, you have to do it within a reasonable amount of time. Long-term suspension student has a right to a prompt written explanation of the facts, a right to a hearing, including having an attorney present. That student can subpoena witnesses, and the school districts can subpoena witnesses as well. In fact, if they go subpoena a teacher, they're supposed to give the teacher a two-day notice because they got to prepare lesson plans and all that. They could be out having a hearing unless it's after school. Then you might have to, have to pay for a babysitter or something like that so to do that. But they have a right to present and refute evidence and cross-examine and face witnesses. As an administrator, I never like to use a student as a witness. Now, maybe that's the only choice that I had. Uh, at least today, there's videos and all kinds of things that you can get instead. Because somebody is, is, is videoing it. In fact, uh, there was um, one, when there one a fight in um, um, Barrow County the other day, mm -hmm. and, and, you oh, know, yeah. and there was a video of that. So that makes it a lot better when you can see the video instead. But bottom line is that you, you, the reason I hesitate to have students be witnesses is when they get on that witness stand and an adult attorney comes and start quizzing them, and Johnny's parents and Johnny are sitting right there, you might want to change your story. You might be, you know, too afraid to say, well, maybe I didn't see what I already said. I always, anytime there was some of that, and I used to see it with, I had to write down what, what they are in elementary school. Maybe sometimes I'd say, tell me, let me write it, and then I'd read it to them and let them sign it. Uh, but I always try to have that. Of course, Johnny can still change the story. And of course, my question then would be, well, why did you tell me this this day? And now you change the story. But again, when it starts getting to be doubt, it makes it a little more difficult. I like to use adults when I can to, to, uh, uh, for that. And then the board makes a decision based on the pundits of evidence. Remember I said it can be, it can be a tribunal where it's some trained individuals. 
Most of the time, the teacher's administrator. Sometimes it's a teacher and administrator and a parent on there, something of that sort. But like I said, when that tribunal makes the decision, it's just like court hearing. They, uh, you don't have to have a court stenographer. I mean, you can just take the the, the hearing and then type it up on the transcript. Then the board, if it's appealed to the board, the board can you know read it and then say, well, we uh, we uphold the the decision of the tribunal, or well, we think the tribunal erred and we overrule. Or they could say, well, we're not going to suspend expulsion for a year, we're going to suspend for 30 days. So, I mean, you know, the board, the board of education, the buck stops with the board of education as far as, as the decision. Okay, and remember I was talking about the, um, uh, you know, when you have, get that imbalance, the district really did need to present data showing it's not based on race. All right, corporal punishment. Defined as the use of physical force. Is it legal in Georgia? Yes. yes. Yes, it is. You're exactly right. As of 2008, if somebody wants to really get industrial someday and look it up now and see what it is, but in uh, 2008, 21 states, mostly in the South and Southwest, legally say you can pat. General guidelines, though, it's not a first offense, no use of excessive force, and must be done from an adult witness employee. In other words, if Kakisha was teaching and she got mad at Johnny, she just can't take that paddle and whack him a couple of times because she needs to have an adult witness with her. As an administrator, I certainly, back in the um, 70s, I paddled. I, I wouldn't, uh, the first couple of paddles, I really kind of felt about, probably as bad as a student. But about the second week, line up. I was ready, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, because it was generally accepted in that school that, that mm -hmm. you paddle when, when kids got up. In fact, I'll, I'll never forget one day, uh, back in my young career as an assistant principal, I was sitting behind the desk and I uh, told this girl that she continued to do things, I was going to suspend her. I'd already paddled her or, or something. And so when when it came and I told the parent, the parent said, well, did she really do so and so? And I said, yes, ma'am. That lady jumped up and went, wham, wham, and slapped her child in the face about three times while I could get her front of the desk and stop her. That was the last time I suspended that girl, I can tell you that. Knowing what I know now, I should have referred her to defects, but at the time, you know, I didn't know, of course, it wasn't that big of an issue back then, it was just a parent taking care of the, of the child. But anyhow, Ingram versus Wright, uh, a, a lawsuit was brought against the principal for paddling the child and um, claimed it was excessive. And when the court ruled, they ruled, say, if you are go, if you are go paddle, which is legal, then you need to make sure it's a witness. And it really shouldn't be a first time offense, like the first time Johnny talked. You ought to at least warn Johnny and say, Johnny, if you talk. But now, if it's something real severe, you could possibly have uh, that. And here's another thing. Even if a parent tells you, you cannot spank my child, you still have the legal authority to do it. And I remember one case, well, I should say a case, but one incident where uh, a principal called and said, you know, I've got Johnny in my office. I can either suspend him for three days or, or I can paddle him. The parents said, don't you dare spank him. You send him home for three days. Well, they hung up the phone. Johnny said, no, sir, I don't want the suspension. I want to paddle him because I'm playing basketball and I want to stay. And so the uh, principal paddled him and, you know, the parent got mad. But I'm going to do it because legally he did it. And, um, in South Carolina, when I was teaching back in 2008, we sent permission slips home. And the parents will sign whether to paddle or not yeah. paddle. And that's probably, if you were paddle, I, I would certainly want the parents' blessing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it, it's not required in the law. Uh, there, if you remember a couple years ago in um, Jasper County, mm -hmm. there was a problem with a kindergarten kid. And they, he had poor attendance, but also he had poor behavior. And the parent brought him so they had a conference one day. And the, and the parents said, well, you just go ahead and pat him in front of me and he'll know that you mean business. Well, the teacher paddled the child, the parent filmed it, and then sent it to the news media. And uh, of course, it made, it made national news where a child was being banned because some people are against corporal punishment, period. And I, I mean, even I got phone calls and emails from people out of state saying that teacher needs to be revoked her license. Well, I just so. It's the longest mm -hmm. I mean, in Georgia, you can't you can't paddle. I just don't remember getting warnings 
before, right? Oh, I got pounded. <laughs> I was good, so that never happened. But, but you know, and the, oh, and the, as a child, I got paddled a long time ago. Yeah, I don't remember any warnings. I truly recommend, even though it's legal, and some school districts prohibit it. I, I, Gwinnett may be right. one of them. They, they do now, yeah. Yeah, and, and I would recommend that you don't do it because, you know, what's to happen <laughs> if Wayne is a paddle a kid and the parent finds out and pat him some more and then the kid the next day have blood blisters and bruises and the parent claimed that Wayne did it? I mean, it's kind of hard for you to say that you didn't. Even if you've got a witness, you know, maybe the witness said, yeah, he wore his tail out. I mean, you know, so I, I, just, I just think that, that you're asking for trouble. You, you, you're asking for a lawsuit, particularly this day where people are very willing to go to court. And so, again, my advice, don't paddle. And I use Jasper Candy as the example, even though the parent asked the teacher to paddle. The off-campus behavior schools do have authority to suspend or deny admission to students who are charged, convicted of a serious crime. We talked about one of the cases there. Uh, you may have to offer alternative education. You know, a lot of court systems and law officials really want you to have something for the child because what they don't want is 20 kids running wild during school day with people at work and then breaking into houses and defacing property. They want you to send them to an alternative school or something. And nowadays, I mean, really, it's expected that you do about everything you can to keep a child in school. Violations of school rules off campus, it must show a link between off campus behavior and disruption to the school environment, as we talked about, and that principal should have done some things. Now, off campus also can mean you having the senior prom, or whatever y'all call it nowadays, and you have it at a hotel or something like that. It's still a school function, and school rules do um, still uh, apply. All right, Title IX, uh, a clause of the 19, 1972 Education Act stating no one should be, because of sex, be denied the benefits of any educational program or activity, or receives federal aid. Lots of every college, unless it's just about every, yeah, well, it's every school district, I believe, and probably just about every college. And most of the Title IX is the sex discrimination, particularly when we talk about uh, athletic events and opportunities for girls versus guys. Uh, pay, uh, because at one time men got paid more than women. In fact, when I first started teaching, the uh, men got $300 more than women because we were supposed to do extra duties like take up tickets at football games or, you know, supervise, uh, you know, the students' discipline. And remember, this time, this time I mean, teachers weren't making but five or $6,000, so $300 was a lot of money. And of course, some teachers complained about it and threatened to go to court, so that quickly changed. But um, Title IX applies to all education institutions that receive federal funds, and um, it applies to elementary through, through college, it talks about sexual harassment, eliminating discrimination course offerings. If you remember one time, the girls took what? Home ec. Home ec and the guys took? Shot. Shot. Now, you can't do that. You want to see boys and girls take home ec, and you have to see boys and girls take shop. In fact, at one time, to coerce that, because boys didn't want to do that, is that you just said, this is the course. On Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays, you go to this, and on Tuesdays, it was almost a forced requirement just to, to meet the federal law there. And then, of course, you know, if you look at some of the uh, athletics, um, uh, if, if you go to the baseball field, and it has night lights and it has nice dugouts. You go to the girls' uh, softball field, it doesn't even have a fence. The dugouts are wood and about falling apart and no lights. Let me tell you what, if somebody files a complaint, you better have a plan where you're trying to upgrade the facility to make them equal because you really are supposed to allow equal things. Another thing you're really supposed to do is have that survey to determine things. You can't just say, oh no, we're not going to have volleyball because if you have enough interest in volleyball, then you really are supposed to, to, to offer that. And if you don't offer, you better have something like for golf. You better let girls play on the guy's team. All right, if a girl wants to go out for football now, can they? Absolutely. And you better not cut her either unless, you, unless you've cut some others as well. And uh, so it just makes all kinds of, 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 of you know, difficulties sometimes. And a school can be in compliance if they meet one of these three criteria, proportionality. In other words, if you got uh, six percent female and four percent male, then your participation in sport should, you know, closely resemble 
that. If you only got 20% of the girls participating and, and 90% of the boys, then that may be out of proportion. Uh, you got to show that you're continually working to improve. You know, you may not have two million dollars to do that softball field, but you need to have some type of plan to show that by X date we'll have been able to save some money or done this or have capital projects so that we can do that. And then the interest, you know, if, if you do it, you need to do it through surveys to determine, you know, if, if another sport uh, can take part. You know, one of the things now, lacrosse is getting pretty big in, in the metro area. I'm not aware of a whole bunch of uh, lacrosse teams in South Georgia and, and uh, some other areas. So, again, that. All right, so you understand that, the, the, you know, Title IX is kind of, I don't want to say old news now, but most people know a little bit about Title IX. Of course, some choose to ignore it. But, uh, oh, and, and I think one of you mentioned in your court case about they brought suit under Title IX. Yeah, and I think that we're going to talk about that in a few minutes as well with our Gwinnett case as well. All right, student searches. We talked a little bit about that. In fact, uh, uh, Chris, I lowered his grade because he stole a little bit of our thunder to talk about TLO. But um, uh, you've got to start, like you said, with the assumption that any search is an invasion of privacy. Now, most schools now, if you go to that front door, it says we have a right to search anybody that enters the premises. So you kind of put them on notice there. But just because Mike's got a blue shirt doesn't give me the right to, to search him. I've got to have some type, I mean, I've got to assume that it's an invasion. And so for me to do it, uh, I've got to um, have some type of justification for the search. I've got to have some rationale for that. Now, Megan had come to me and said, Mike's got pills in his pocket, that gives me justification to search. It does not give me justification to strip search, but it does give me justification to, to search. And all you elementary teachers, when that $26 is missing and you all search 15 to 20 kids and, and check their book bags, you're violating the law, I can tell you, because you, you don't have a right to do you know, group searches. All right. And it needs to be reasonably related to the scope and the reason of the search. Searching 25 kids for $2 missing, I don't think you can say that that's related to the scope. All right. And uh, should not be excessively intrusive in the light of the age and the sex of the student, the nature of the infraction. You know, the older the kids get, the more you better be very careful about how much you're doing a pat down or whatever you want to call it. And my personal advice, now we, to, we talked about this again, I would never recommend strip search. But let's talk about cases. New Jersey versus TLO in 1985, that's probably the most famous case that gave guidance to uh, schools on searches. Student called by a teacher smoking in the bathroom. When questioned by the assistant principal, she said, I wouldn't smoke it. And furthermore, she didn't even smoke. She said, I wouldn't smoke then, I don't smoke. So the person said, well, let me see your purse. And took it from her. He found a pack of cigarettes, rolling paper, normally associated with marijuana, plastic bags, an unusually large amount of money, a pipe, a small amount of marijuana, and then this card with a list of students who owed her money. Damn, girl. All of that in the girl's pocketbook. So he immediately turned it over to what? The police. She was referred to the police. And of course, they charged her. She went to court. What do you think the first thing she said? They did an illegal search and that they, you ought to throw out all of that evidence right there because it was an illegal search and can't be used in a court hearing. The student went to court, like I said, and that uh, the court ruled the school had a right to search for probable cause. Remember, a teacher had said that the child was smoking. So that gave them reasonable suspicion. When she denied it, it certainly was, you know, acceptable to say, let me look at your purse or let me hold your purse. Now, if the student had said no, you can't go and reach and grab his hand and take it anyhow, because then it might be, you know, considered what I would do then, say, well, we need to call your parents and we need to look at it together. And if you refuse, then that's going to make me feel more 
that you should be suspended because you don't want to see the contents in your purse. But you don't want to snatch it from the student. You just make them sit there with the purse and you call the parents. And, you know, sometimes parents will say, no, you're not going to search my child. You don't have a search warrant, you're going to have this. And others will say, yeah, you can look, but my child has nothing to hide. So you just have to kind of sometimes play it that way. All right, Horton versus Goose Creek Independent School District. Is it legal to conduct searches of school lockers and cars in parking lot? Absolutely. When you enter school property, you have to follow school rules, and you, it certainly is legal to do that. In fact, uh, when I was sitting there, we used to have the drug dogs come you know, once in a while. I, I felt it was a deterrent to um, you know, kids bringing uh, drugs on campus. Of course, now they just know how to hide them all the places to meet after school and, and dispense them. But uh, anyhow, um, and then Safford versus Reading one week before search. A student reported to the principal that students were bringing drugs and weapons on campus. Did that give a principal uh, kind of maybe a um, suspicion that something was going on? And maybe uh, probably need to keep his eyes and ears open? Because the student was telling him that. And he also reported he had become sick after taking one of the pills offered to him. So he had experimented and whew, I got sick with that pill that that, that student gave me. Well, then on the day of the search, which was about a week later, uh, the same student, the one that said, you know, kids were giving out drugs and they got weapons, came to him and said, here's a pill Melissa gave me. Again, made the principal think, well, maybe there's something to this. So he called uh, Melissa and in her binder, it revealed several pills, over-the-counter over painkillers, a razor blade, and a strip search revealed no other contraband. Well, as they talked, the principal then summoned Savannah Redding to the office, but since Melissa implicated her, Melissa said, well, Savannah's got some stuff too. And several teachers said, yeah, those two girls are tight. Well, one does, probably one does. Some mean girls. That's right. And a search of Savannah's allegomas revealed no drugs, so the principal got a female administrator to conduct a strip search in which Savannah had to pull out her bra and the elastic band of her underpants. This was in 2009. The court ruled that the search was illegal and principal could be held liable. Again, folks, that principal, assistant principal in Clayton was very lucky, I think, that that judge was kind of lean. And I do think that, that a lot of times courts do tend to try to support school and school teachers. They know it's a tough job. The bottom line, I just can't recommend strip searches. That's going on. So the kids know that, so they will hide there sometimes. Now, you know, the, the police may be able to get, get away with it more than the school system can, I don't know. But anyhow, school resource officer. Let me talk to you a little bit about that. Most of y'all have a school resource, so even y'all have some that visit. Now, don't you all know at least one day a week or something? They are an asset to the schools. I'll be the first to say that. But what I'll also tell you is this. They're held to a higher standard because they're involved with criminal law. A lot of times we're involved in civil law, plus we're not an officer, uh, you know, and so we have, uh, as a principal, we have a little more leeway. So what I would tell people, if you suspect something, you as an administrator do the investigation first, then when you find something, you turn it over to the police to handle, you know, from a, from a legal matter. It's just, it's just cleaner. And uh, that was uh, even emphasized the Shade versus City of uh, Farmington. Green versus Camerata in 2011, the State Child Protection Services worker and a deputy sheriff interviewed a nine-year-old girl at an Oregon school about allegations that her father was sexually abusing her. Now let's think about that a minute. How many social workers are willing to go to the parents' home and say, we came here to interview your nine-year-old daughter about you sexually abusing her? You're just not going to do that. You want to get the girl when she's in somewhere that's fairly safe, right? and so you want to do it at school. There are times when police will come to the school and want to interview Johnny about a theft that happened on the weekend where 20 bicycles were missing. And it puts the school district in a pretty precarious position because in one way you want to work with law enforcement because you sure need them on your side. In another way, you want to make sure that you're not giving up the student rights. And so my first advice is to have some type of memorandum of understanding or some type of agreement with how things can be handled when a police officer comes to your school. Now, to me, I think it's reasonable 
that if you go interview somebody, I'm going to have a guidance counselor or an administrator there sitting with the student to make sure her rights aren't being abused, to make sure that she isn't being grilled too intently, you know, that type of thing. But allow the police officer to do their work, even if you don't have to call the parents. Some parents would claim you need to have, you should have called me first. I don't think that's the case sometimes when you do, because that's the specific reason why the police officer came. But I would certainly, again, I want some type of guidelines in writing so the sheriff's department, police department, and the school district know what's to be expected. And on this one, they had no warrant or permanent assent. And that may be part of the, the, the uh, MOU, the memorandum of assent, is that if you come and you want it, you need to have some type of legal document in your hand authorizing you to talk with this child at the school, some type of search warrant. And uh, the court trial ensued based on the girl's testimony. The family brought suit based on the violation of the Fourth Amendment. And they ruled for the parents, but they did rule that this, the state workers could not be sued that because they were with the state, they had sovereign immunity. And that's what happens most of the time when you work for a state, uh, unless you're grossly negligent, you go, they go bend up a back to protect you. However, that's not to say just ignore the law. But I just know that, that uh, most of the time the courts, if you use reasonable decision-making skills of what a normal reasonable person would do, then you're probably okay. It's just when you have that S on your forehead and do something really stupid is when you can get in trouble. All right, child protection agencies, the fine line when an agency comes to school to interrogate and interview a student. I mean, it really is because you are actually serving as a parent during that time. And most parents are not going to drop their child off and say, now, school district, when I leave my child there, if you want the police to come or you want somebody else to come here, go right ahead. I don't care who talks to my child. No, they, they don't expect, they expect you to protect them. From, they don't expect the, that to come. So again, um, you just need to know what the board policy or the memorandum of understanding is. I would advise that no sort of be questioning and make sure the student was informed of their rights. All right, random drug testing. Can we random drug test? Mm -hmm. You sure? Absolutely. The high school does it. So Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we did it like And I, I was a favorite student because I thought it was, that gave some kids an opportunity to say, I can't do that because I have a chance of being drunk. And it gave them an out from having that social pressure. And I felt that was good. And uh, Veronica, Veronia School District versus Acton in 1995, the school was faced with a drug problem. School officials believe athletes were the leaders of the drug culture, and student athletes have a diminished expectation of privacy. Why? They're voluntarily participating. As well. And they're representing, representing the, school. the school. Exactly. And uh, so the district had established that athletes were the leaders of the drug culture, and that the severity of the need had been established, they had admitted they had a problem at the school, and they also had data to show there was an increase in injuries because the kids were taking drugs and, and maybe not in the best of shape or whatever, and that it was going to be done on a random basis. All of that being said, the courts ruled that it is legal to do a random uh, drug search. And other court cases justified extending the test to other groups of students, but courts are split depending on the justification and other rationale. You can't have it where you go do the whole student body and say, okay, all student bodies are subjected to random testing. You can't do that. I would think it may be risky, but you could probably say, if you drive and park on campus, we have a right to do random drug tests, you'll be on there, but you better be able to prove this random and that you're not picking Megan's name out every time for spite. You know, you have to go to one of those random order books or you have to put everybody's name in a hat and make sure that Megan's name's not in there 10 times, you know, that type of thing. But, uh, I mean, but it does need to be random. Now, let me just kind of give an example. All right, Chris is the band director for Marching Band Tigers. And they are a wonderful band, and they are going to Florida. They are actually going to perform at halftime of the Orange Bowl. Go, and they're going to be going for three days. One day to drive down there, one day to perform, one day to, to uh, enjoy Florida during December, and then come back on the fourth day. So Chris says to them, don't you bring any alcohol or drugs to this for four days. Because I want you to be on your best behavior and I'm going to search every one of you. 
when you walk on, I'm gonna search you and I'm gonna search your your baggers. We're not gonna have any problem. We're representing the school at the Orange Bowl. Can he do that? Nope. Because what is he doing? He's not randomly searching. You can randomly search some, and you can't say, well, I'm going to search Johnny, Susie, and Billy, because I know darn well that they, if anybody brings it to them. <laughs> you've actually got to go to a random, and you've got to be able to justify that you're doing it randomly. Same thing in the classroom if $30 is missing. You can't search every kid. But if Susie says, well, I think Billy did it, that would give you some type of suspicion that maybe you need to search Billy. Okay? The Georgia laws, uh, each local board shall adopt policy designed to improve student learning environment by improving student behavior and discipline. It's amazing, I don't like to pick on legislators, but I like to say that they think if they make a law, that automatically solves the problem. You know, it's like the, the bullying, if you make a law and make it against it, then no more going to bully anymore. Uh, student support uh, process must be developed to assist every student. And progressive discipline process is designed to create expectation that uh, discipline is in proportion to severity behavior. Code of conduct, local board of education shall provide for distribution of student code of conduct to students and parents. They should secure signature when we talked about that earlier. Authority of the teacher. 20-2-730, teachers shall have authority to remove a student from class who repeatedly or substantially interferes with class or is an immediate threat. You have that right. Sort of. <laughs> yeah. Sort of. It is in the law. But let me tell you what. You send a student to me and tell me that you're not going to teach that child anymore, and I'm going to find a way to get you. Because that's not your job to throw away the ten bad kids and give to somebody else and you have all the good kids. Your job is to teach the kids that, uh, that you're assigned to, and your job is to do that progressive discipline and keep records and show that you're trying to work with that, that kid. Uh, teacher shall file a report with the principal describing the student's behavior one page or less at the end of the day. So can't you see at the end of the day, Jonah goes marshal that principal and gives him a slap stand on his desk, a one page document says, here's this child that I'm not going to teach tomorrow. He's yours. That's funny because I actually did that. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. I actually, I had an email and have a child removed out of my room. But it was an ongoing situation. Yeah. It was just and, and they had been forewarned. Many yeah, times. yeah. And, and you probably have to, to my, me and other students. So, and and, and yeah. principal and truly, principal should take steps to remove mm -hmm. students that are unruly. Mm -hmm. But bottom line, some teachers are just going to get rid of every kid they don't like. Mm -hmm. It may be the slow learners. It may be you know whatever <laughs> they think in pizza. And uh, the principal shall meet with the teacher and the student, giving the student an opportunity to give his side of the story. And the principal shall provide written or explanation and notify the parents. Now. Oh, we're going really to have a lot of personal, we're really going to have a lot of time to meet with that teacher, don't they? Maybe after school, before school, during the, the, uh, the um, uh, well, they don't, they don't even have plenty of time. Maybe during when, when kids <laughs> right. have PE yeah, and music, yeah, right? And, uh, but anyhow, um, after the conference, if the teacher refuses to have a student class, the principal will determine an appropriate temporary placement and convene a placement review committee. Let me tell you what, if I'm principal, I'll be able to scramble around and find another teacher to take Johnny for a day. When I have my committee to meet, my review committee, you better believe I'm going to have a rubber stamp committee. And they're going to go back and say, Johnny's not a problem if those appropriate strategies are used, and you're going to have him back in there. I can tell you that. And the decision must be with it made within three days from removed from class. And I guarantee you, I'll make a decision in the next day. Yeah, the parents should be advised to the The training should be provided to the local board of education to place the committee team members, that review committee. So that, um, and the committee reviews placement options and renders decisions, almost like an IEP kind of thing. All right, and the report, and the report filed with the Department of Ed by August 1st of every year. They report the number of discipline infractions, in-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, expulsions, corporal punishment, alternative placements. All that has to be turned in every year. And then the State Department compiles it and sends it to the feds. And it has to be done by age, grades, gender, race, rare and lunch, because they're looking for discrimination. Chronic discipline, students identified as one who exhibits a pattern of behaviors characteristic which interferes with learning, which is probably what you had, a chronic discipline problem. Person notifies parents by phone, first class mail, certified mail, overnight mail, with return receipt of meeting, inviting the parents to attend. The meeting is scheduled to devise a plan to correct Johnny. 
and the parent refuses to attend or cooperate, then you ask him to file a lawsuit in the court claiming that the parent is uncooperative in helping little Johnny learn how to behave. And then if the parent refuses to attend the next time when the court orders him to attend and work with the school, they can be fined up to $500. Now, felonies, the local board of education is authorized to refuse to readmit or enroll any student who has been indicted for the commission of any felony. So if you've got a child that has a felony, you don't have to let them in school. And then not only that, uh, if they try to go to another school, that school doesn't have to take them based on this law. It doesn't say, it doesn't say you have to refuse. I mean, if he's a 6'10 basketball player and <laughs> your record's 3 and 8, you know, right, then you may say, well, we'll give him a chance. <laughs> <laughs> and upon refusal, the parent has the right to request a hearing, which is what the parent did in uh, uh, Bartow. State prefers placement in the alternative center rather than expulsion. And felony is a crime usually involving violence, bullying, we've kind of already talked about, and so I don't really need to go into that, even though it's in the PowerPoint. Physical violence against a school employee, you can imagine, no, a student charged with physical violence of a school employee shall be immediately referred for a hearing, and if finding the physical <laughs> balance, the student shall be expelled, but the school may assign the student to an alternative school, and if the student's in grades K through eight, he or she may be allowed to re-enter the regular school. So it could really be an eighth grade student that gets physical with the teacher and the next day right back in your class. Enrollment, attendance, and transfer, free to all children in the district they reside. May charge non residents the amount locally financed for students, including the five mil share. Allegedly, the state provides five mils. Anything above that, uh, the school district provides. You must obtain the age of five by September 1 through age of 20. And so you don't have to accept a child that's four, even though he's a genius. You can, and then prohibit you to, but you don't have to. You don't get any money until that child is of legal age. A parent may delegate custody to the grandparent due to hardship, by executing power of attorney. They are making it easier and easier for parents now to have guardianship and get them in the school's quote where they want to go. And uh, immunization must be completed within 30 days. Of course, somebody can object to it on, on religious matters. So that's all that. All right.